I'm John Rigetti. These days, everybody's talking about it. Sex, that is. Father John Abdallah, Dean of St. George Orthodox Cathedral, will be talking today about sexuality with one of the foremost theologians in the Orthodox Christian faith. He's Father Thomas Hopko, and he's the Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in Crestwood, New York. He's written countless articles, publications, and books, and is a sought-after speaker on the Orthodox Christian faith. We're fortunate that he's now living here in the greater Pittsburgh area. Father Hopko has also recently written a book about one aspect of human sexuality, and he'll be discussing that today. I bet you'll be surprised what he has to say. Father Tom, there are so many opinions out there about what sex is about. What should Christians think about sex? What should Christians think about sex? Um, I think uh, the first thing we have to say that we're talking about Christians. I think it's very, very important to, to kind of establish that. In other words, when we try to answer any question at all, whatever it is about who and how and what God is, sure. why the world exists, why there are plants and animals, I mean, whatever, uh, then we look to the gospel, and that means the teaching of Christ and the teaching about Christ of, of the Christian church how he reveals things. And then, of course, that takes us into the entire uh, the Bible for Christians. I mean, mm -hmm. the vision of reality that because it all speaks about him. And we would even say that the story in Genesis of Adam and Eve and so on ultimately speaks to us about a life that is completely revealed and fulfilled in its form in Jesus. So basically, I think what we would say <laughs> if, we, if we were saying, okay, well, what does that all have to do with sex? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that what we would certainly have to say and Orthodox would say this, uh, is, well, three things, I think. One, like everything, it's created by God. God created us male and female. The gender distinction of masculine and feminine, male and female, in our interpretation of the scripture, is the will of God. Now, some people think, well, God only did it because he knew we would sin or whatever. You can get into those kind of discussions of what that could mean, but as a matter of fact, if you read the scripture, it says God created human beings, anthropos, human beings in his own image and likeness. Male and female created he them. In fact, I like to uh, point out that in the, there are two stories of creation in Genesis. In the second one, uh, probably two, two traditions making two different theological points. Sure. Uh, but I always like to point out that the first no good out of the mouth of God in the Bible <laughs> is when he sees the, the earth creature, Adamach, all alone. You know, God creates the animals, says, very good. The sun and the moon, very good. The stars, the fish, the animals, good, good. Kalos in Greek means very good, I think nine times. Then in that story, he, he creates the earth creature. He looks at him, he says, no good. And then it says, and God fashions then the woman, and he says, very good. So as St. Paul will say much later, he will say, in the Lord... The male is not apart from or without woman, and the woman is not without or apart from man, and their communion together, to be, to be one together in communion, the two becoming one, and this would not only apply to marriage, it would apply to human life, uh, generally, because we would say that this is first of all a spiritual issue. You can't be a complete, full human being as a man, unless you have proper communion and relationships, love and so on with, uh, well, first of all, with men, uh, and then with, with, sure. uh, with women, so and vice versa. Alone. So We're not alone. We're in communion with exactly. each other. We relate to each exactly. other. Exactly. And so what you have is you have two forms of being human where the humanity is identical. And here, this would be a dogma of orthodoxy. There's only one human nature. There's not a nature of man and nature of woman. There's one human nature. But every human being has the same humanity, yet every human being is unique. Every human being is different. No two human beings are the same. And then, of course, when you get into history, a big part of our differences have to do with our parentage, our, our mother and father and how we were born and, and what our story is. So everyone is unique. But one of the aspects of, of being a human being is to be either a man or a woman. And, and then this would lead to our second great conviction in, in Orthodox Christianity, and that is that the world as we know it now is not the way God created it. <laughs> that the intention of God from the beginning 
was never fulfilled. Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, prototypical in the Bible, and here in our church, Adam and Eve don't stand as two individuals like Joseph and Mary or, or Abraham and Sarah. Adam means the earth creature. Eve means Zoe, the mother of the living. It's obviously a, a, an inspired theological story. It's, it's a theological word about God's intention for the human race, an intention that never was completed from the beginning because the first thing that these two creatures did was they sinned. So what we would say is, and we would look at sexuality as we know it now, in the situation of a corrupted, fallen world, that we're all bound up in this together. And because sexuality is such an important part of our life, essential to our humanity, that's a big area where the human sin, perversion, foolishness, rebellion against God, you know, bears its, its fruit. <laughs> And so that's why uh, sexuality, uh, but we would never say, uh, I think maybe some Christians might hold this, that sex was the sin of Adam and Eve. That's not our teaching. Right. And that reproduction is somehow a blessed sin. That's not our teaching. Uh, we were talking about Mary uh, recently on this program where uh, we didn't get into it. But in our church, the conception of Mary by her parents, Joachim and Anna, is a big church festival. We have icons. We kiss it and everything. And, and we say it was most holy, immaculate. But unlike um, uh, some other Christians, we would never say that God had to act to clean it up because the sin of Adam was there. Or something. That's not our approach at all. It's very different. But the goodness, but then the fallenness, you know, that it's not the way it ought to be. Nothing is the way it ought to be. Nothing in this world. But then the third point is redemption. Our Lord Jesus Christ, whose first title is bridegroom, <laughs> he, and he loves the, the world and the church as his bride. Uh, and so for us, the great image of how the sexes should interrelate are revealed to us in Jesus. Jesus had women disciples. He had a mother and so on. Now, he was a celibate. His mother also, according to our faith, as we learned also on this program, was never, she was married, but she never was a biological mother, never had sex with anybody because the father of Jesus is God. And that has nothing to do with denigrating sexuality. It's just a matter of fact, if you give birth to the son of God, there can't be a human father. I mean, simple as That's that. Right. But the blessing, the first miracle was at a wedding in Cana. <laughs> Uh, and so and the Apostle Peter, you know, the, the founder in the church in Rome, although we don't think he was the first bishop, but he was the founder. He was married. Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So marriage is part of the story, but it's not essential. And to have sexual intercourse genitally also is not essential to be a fulfilled human being. If that were the case, most of our saints would be considered less than human because they were celibates. Uh, they were not married However, sexuality isn't only about marriage. I mean, a, ch a child has a father and a mother and how they're treated. I mean, one of our daughters, you know, in our church, the priests are, are married, <laughs> and many are in any case. But one of our daughters used to wear a little button on her coat when she was in high school and said, it's my father's fault. <laughs> you know, it's my father's fault. Well, I told her, Katie, if you're smart enough to wear the button, it's not my fault anymore. But as a matter of fact, she has a father, she has a mother, and how that impacts on her, impacts on her entire life, including her sexual life when she grows up. And, you know, and, and so sexuality is at the heart of the matter. And it's holy. It's a gift. It's a grace. But it has been like everything. It has been ruined. It has been twisted. And we mentioned the book. I mean, uh, John mentioned the book that, that I recently wrote, just a yes. little book here. But it's about same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. Because what we think is that part of the... Of, our world getting all messed up is that not only are, are men and women kind of can be sexually, passionately attracted with no love, with no communion, with no care. It could be just a carnal thing. But even the highest loves can get all twisted up and so on in this fallen world. And we do have the phenomenon that some of us, uh, some human beings, are definitely sexually attracted to people of their own sex. Mm -hmm. So we got to deal with that. <laughs> Sure. Uh, but I think that it's important probably with sexuality to know that it's not to be adored, idolized as the be-all, end-all of human life, sure. as it is in some circles today, nor is it to be demonized as something 
dirty, shameful, sinful. It's just an aspect of human life that is given to us by God for our holiness and consecration. So it's all in how we use it. And here, that would be even a principle of, of, of Orthodox tradition. A principle would be, there is no such thing as evil as such. Evil is always a perversion or a misuse or an abuse of something fundamentally good. And here we want to affirm sexuality is good. It's created by God. St. John Chrysostom, one of our great saints whose liturgy we serve every Sunday, he said in a commentary on Titus, to the pure all things are pure and to the impure nothing's pure. He said, uh, if sexuality is sinful as such, then God is the sinner because he made us this way. Well, he made us this way male and female, but you can't say he made us this way being, you know, carnally impassioned and, and using sexuality in every possible way through every possible orifice on your body or whatever. That is not uh, our understanding of the goodness of sexuality. But we do believe that Jesus revealed to us the goodness of it. And it's goodness could love be and communion in every way. And in marriage, it includes erotic genital intercourse for the sake of family and children. And then those who are not married, they still have to interact in loving manner with people of their own sex, with the other sex. But for us, that would never involve uh, sexual intercourse, genital sexual intercourse of any kind. Uh, the, the love would be, in that sense, um, well, according to Christ. And we could talk about that some more. Perhaps you'd like sure. to talk about that with uh, Mother Magdalene, or John might, you know. Absolutely. As a nun. Yeah. So we'll talk more about what sex is, what God reveals uh, sex to be, what sex really is for uh, after the break. And, um, and now we'll hear Mother Magdalena uh, give us some understanding of, of sexual expression in the world that isn't between husband and wife and is also holy and is off and also real. Thank you, Father. Does the Orthodox Church permit abortion? No, but Orthodox clergy have to be prepared to give pastoral advice and support in difficult cases, such as a threat to the life of the mother. For the Orthodox, an abortion can never be a lifestyle choice made independently of God's law that we do not kill. My guest is Mother Magdalena from the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, Pennsylvania. And we're here talking, I'm sure Mother, most people will be surprised to hear our topic today about human sexuality. Um, as a monastic, um, do you view yourself as a sexual being? What role is sexuality play in you as an individual? Well, yes, of course I view myself as a, as a sexual being because I am fully a woman. Um, some people, they, they, they wonder about nuns and they say, well, maybe they're sort of um, odd or something, but, uh, or they're uh, sexually unfulfilled, but that's not true at all in the monastic life. I think that often, you're absolutely right, that often people may look at sisters living in a monastery and say, gee, they have given up so much. When you reflect on your life, and particularly in relationship to human sexuality, how do you feel about this concept of giving up? Well, for me, the celibate life, the life of a consecrated celibate, was definitely a choice. I had opportunities to get married. I didn't become an Orthodox nun until I was 40 years old. And before that, I had dated various men in the years before that. And so I could have well gotten married. Um, but I chose the life of, of a nun. I chose the life of a celibate um, primarily because I fell in love with Christ. And that's really a, really a very profound concept. When people think about the relationship of a sister with Christ, is it, can you liken it to a marriage? Uh, you can in a, in a way. Of course, there is, there, the, the physical aspect of marriage is not there at all. But the aspect of the soul and the, the human being that desires union, which is what marriage is, is about, is two people coming together to become one. Uh, Bishop Callistos Ware talks about marriage as a, as a mediated love, that, that a man or a woman comes to Christ through their spouse, comes to their salvation through their spouse. But in the monastic life, it's unmediated. The monastic has that relationship directly with Christ. 
and and so there's uh, that 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 love that fulfillment is very much present, and that's what makes celibacy make sense. Otherwise, it is. It's just something harsh, and you have to sort of deal with all the things, all your desires and whatnot. But when you have the relationship with Christ, that where that's that sense of Him living in you, in your heart, then that presence is very sweet. And it's very desired. And quite frankly, even if the most perfect man came to me now and asked to marry me, I would say no, I would have no interest in it. Because the love that I feel from him and the relationship that I feel from him is so special, uh, it's so intimate and so sweet, that I can't imagine a relationship with a man that could be better. You know, when people talk about marriage, and we often get to the concept of sexuality in marriage, and as Father Tom talked about, the genital relationship, the, the love that happens, the, the actual sexual intercourse with, between a couple. But a lot of times as we talk about marriage, we don't think about the spiritual component of that marriage, particularly here in the West. Um, but we in the Orthodox Church especially um, have a very strong spiritual component yes. to this union. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, in, a, in a marriage, in an orthodox marriage, in order to be salvific, it really only works when there are three people in the marriage, the man, the woman, and Christ. And so um, even though there is the physical aspect in, the, in a marriage, before that, there has to be the spiritual aspect. There has to be the spiritual union of the couple with Christ. And um, so in, in the monastic life, sometimes it's difficult not to have that, that that uh, that physical aspect, and sometimes you have you have those desires, and you have to deal with them. But it's so much worth it that, uh, and and I would think probably John, you would say, if I asked you if marriage was easy, what would you say? Of course, it's not. Well, the monastic life in some ways is not easy either. But so, what's easy? What part of life is easy? And if it's if the goal is what you want, and my goal is union with Christ for eternity then it's worth the struggle that it takes to make that happen. And if my goal is union with Christ as a partner in marriage, that union, that Christian union of wife and husband together helps enrich that relationship with Christ as well. Yes. Right. Thank you so much for being with us Thank today. You, as always, a pleasure. Thank you. Please stay with us. We're going to go back to Father John and Father Tom as we explore Father Tom's book on same-sex attraction. Why must a priest be married before he is ordained? In fact, he must be married before he is ordained deacon. This is to ensure that those who must guide others in married life have already settled down in their own lives. Similarly, a person should not properly be ordained a priest until he is at least 30 years old. I'm Father John Abdullah, and we're talking to Father Tom Hopko about sexuality and Christianity. Father Tom, I read your book on um, the Christian faith and same-sex attraction, and it certainly occurred to me that it's more than about same-sex attraction, but a whole worldview of what it means to be Christian, what it means to be created by God, what it means to uh, be stewards of our bodies and, and our, express our our, our wholeness. It, it, it really is well, I'm an exciting glad to, book. I'm glad that you got that, Father John, right. because that was one of the intentions <laughs> of the intention, conscious intention of the book, uh, was to say if you believe in Christ and you view human life in a certain way, then you view sexuality in a certain way. So in a sense, this little book is, um, is just kind of a case study uh, in that particular issue. Uh, and it's, it's to make the point also that... Um, Sexuality is uh, a central issue for every human being on this earth and that our sexual emotions and passions are very often not, not very often, I would almost say exclusively, not chosen. You have feelings that you have. Sure. And here I would even say, I make this point in the book about choice. Uh, Mother Magdalene spoke about choosing to become a nun and so on. In a sense, we understand what a person means when they say that. You know, I chose to be married. I married I chose to accept to be ordained a priest. But there's a sense in which it's not really a choosing when you're a Christian. 
It's more a, a, a case of surrendering to what you believe God wants you to be and do. You just kind of say yes to God. So, so some people, uh, if they're seeking God, they want to say yes to God and to live in a certain way. Now, when it but comes we to... we do have free will. Oh, of course, free we have free will. We will. choose to say no to well, God. Well, sure, because you can... In, in fact, we have free will, which means we can go make, making all kinds of choices thinking that we're autonomous being making choices. But once a person says, God exists, God created me, God loves me, God revealed himself to me, and Christ is the model of that. You can't imagine Jesus Christ choosing anything. He said, my words are not mine. They're the words of the Father. My will is not mine. In the Gethsemane Garden, he wasn't deliberating. He said, I'd love not to be crucified, Father. <laughs> All but, things are possible, but not my will. Your will be done. So what we're seeking is the will of God. Now here, I mean, the, the, the very, very scandalous point of Christianity for many, many people is that we would claim we're created to be lovers. We're created and, and to love, as C.S. Lewis said, in the four ways. Agape love, live for the good of the other. Eros love, to live for communion and union with the other. Philia love, which is friendship. Storgi, which is affection. And so those elements should be in every act of love. Now, we Christians, Orthodox, certainly would claim that the sex act, the intercourse act... <laughs> coital act, mm -hmm. when it is loving and really according to God's plan and teaching is an act that is exclusively between a man and a woman in a community of marriage. It's, it's, it's given, there it can be a loving act because it not only binds the two together into one flesh, mm -hmm. but it also is complementary, just as our bodily parts. It's also productive of life. Uh, it also is an ongoing relation. And it even in the Bible, by the way, in the Bible, the main um, uh, analogy uh, of uh, um, the main symbol uh, for God's relation to the world, Yahweh's relation to Israel, Christ of the church, is marriage. It's a conjugal act of marriage where, where you have a union of the two that become one. So you have two distinct forms of humanity, male and female, who become one in a communion of love. Now, that kind of communion has to exist just generally between human beings. Those love, love has to exist between men. Love has to exist between men and women. Uh, when they're not married, for, and, and of course the family, you have the children who are boys and girls, and the parents are father and mother. Uh, sure. You see? So, and and this, is, this is part of the sexual act of, of, of communion. So even in a monastery, I mean, I had a friend who used to say, if you become a monastic, you don't become a nunk. You're either a monk or a nun. In other words, you're still a man or a woman. And if, and if, and if I would relate to Mother Magdalena, she's a nun, but she's still a woman. Mm -hmm. If I would relate to, I don't know, my bishop, who's a monk, I'm relating to a man. He's a celibate. So, and I, I, and I used to teach hagiology uh, in the school. It's the lives of saints. And, and in all the saints' lives... Most of whom, by the way, were not married. <laughs> you know, in, in other words, if people claim you must have genital sex in order to be a complete, fulfilled human being, our church is in big trouble because <laughs> half the people on our icons <laughs> did not, they were not married or didn't engage in, in sexual love sure. uh, erotically, mm -hmm. right? However, however, uh, we would say that for all the saints had deep, close, loving relations with people of their own sex, and with the opposite sex. So if anybody would hate the opposite sex, for example, they would be in, you know, in the hands of evil. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't become, like Mother said, you can't become a nun because, I don't know, you hate men if you're a woman and you don't want to get married or, or there's some lack in your life. Or, sure. No, it's got to be a positive, wholesome, well, if you want to use the verb choice, but I would prefer to say surrender to the will of God, to say whatever I want, God, I know that for me to save my soul, I don't think I could do it as a monk. <laughs> and so but I all, have a wife. And but all of this love that you describe seems to be acts of, of if not total selflessness, certainly acts of coming out of oneself. Of course. And, and responding to the other. Yes. 
That's why even the physical act of, the, of, of sexual intercourse between one man and one woman, it has to be a coming out of myself. And here I say in the book, not all heterosexual acts are loving and holy and godly. They can be carnal. They can be self-interested. They can be rapacious. They could be self-centered. Uh, and so as Mother pointed out, you have to have a spiritual communion in love and here I think I even might disagree with Bishop Callistus, whom she quoted, who said a married couple somehow have a mediated love through their spouse. Well, I'm not so sure that's true if you're a Christian, because Jesus said, unless you hate father, mother, brother, sister, wife, lands, you can't be my disciple. So I think every person, whether they're married or not, has first to have an unmediated direct communion with God in Christ as our Savior and Lord. Then they express that in a certain way. And some of us express it being married in a family. Others express us in a monastic life. And we have the phenomenon in our time of single people who are living in the world, which is a very hard vocation for a Christian uh, to be single but not to have a community. And I think that in our tradition, we think that, that the people who are not married should have some type of faithful community of, of holiness and fidelity that they belong to. Yeah. Father Tom, thank you so very, very much. You're welcome. Nice to be here. That was a really interesting and thought-provoking discussion on human sexuality. Uh, Father John, what should we take away from today's discussion? God made us sexual, male and female, and he made us good. And it's our opportunity to follow our vocation and express our sexuality in a healthy and holy way. Really gives us something to think about. If you'd like to learn more about the Orthodox Christian faith, listen to Orthodoxy Now. Wednesday mornings at 9.30 on WEDO Radio at 8.10 a.m. on your dial. And be sure to watch Orthodoxy Now on Channel 95, Christian Associates TV in the City of Pittsburgh, and on Comcast On Demand as we bring you programs to help answer your questions. If you have a topic you'd like to learn about, send it to the address on the screen. Thanks for being with us.